What's going on, guys, and welcome to episode 501 of Hashtag Ask GSM here today for Wednesday, July 5th, 2023. I am Graham GS Matthews. Hope you guys are doing well and having a great week so far. I mentioned this last week in episode 500, which was live here on the channel, so for anyone who tuned in, watched after the fact, thank you so much. Um, this week is actually the 10-year anniversary of Hashtag Ask GSM. The actual anniversary, I think, is July 8th, which, as I've mentioned before, is the actual anniversary of Alexis and I as well, so I was never going to go live on that day specifically. Um, it's not our 10-year anniversary, it is our 5-year anniversary, so a lot of cool milestones this uh, this week. Um, but still, I appreciate anyone who tuned into the show last week. I apologize again for the audio issues. I didn't know until after the fact, obviously. Um, I had Alexis, as you could probably tell at the beginning of the stream, check the audio. I mean, this is part of the issue of doing a one-man show, and I should probably have checked this, but I just didn't have a chance. We were rushing to go live before Dynamite. Um, she was listening to the stream on her phone while we were also recording through like an, an you know an AirPod or whatever. She thought it sounded fine, although there may have been an issue. And then she didn't tell me after the fact when I listened to it back that it was probably due to the fact she said, "Oh, it sounds like you're over the phone or something." I wasn't exactly sure what she meant until I listened to it, and then I realized it picked up the computer audio and not my mic audio from right in front of me. I don't know why it did that. I haven't gone live on YouTube in about two years, so it probably just didn't pick up, like, the input or whatever, which was a shame, um, but we got some great content on there, a answering your questions for episode 500, so again, thank you so much for checking on that show, and really your support of the show in general in the last 10 years, uh, whether you're a new listener, old listener, returning listener, doesn't matter, thank you so much for your support. If you want to send in a question to the show, you can do so by tweeting me on the Twitter machine at WrestleRam with the hashtag AskGSM. Find me on Facebook as well, facebook.com backslash graham.gsn.matthews. Drop a comment on the post that I usually put up on Tuesday nights, if not in the wall itself. I forgot to put it up last night due to the holiday. I apologize. But you could also drop a question down below in the comment section on this very video. I'll include your question in next week's edition. Uh, starting with Micah Does, has got a couple questions here. First one being from YouTube. Uh, what do you think of EO, Ka uh, EO Sky cashing in at WrestleMania 40? I don't mind that idea if it was done in a way, and I don't think they have the patience to do that, by the way. I would prefer that EO wait a while to cash in because we've had so many female winners in recent years wait like a day or like less than a day, wait a couple hours on the night of Money in the Bank to have her cash in like a while from now, a la Carmelo, although, although Carmelo did it on the post-WrestleMania SmackDown as a surprise, to have EO be the first to announce it in advance and then do it on Asuka on that show would be wonderful. Couple things, though. I don't think Asuka will be champion by then. Two, I don't think they have enough challengers for her to face between then and now for her to still be champion by then, unless she loses it and gets it back. And three, they're more than likely to do that match and do that feud well before WrestleMania. But that would be what I would do, though. I would probably do EO and Asuka at Mania. I know Bianca and Charlotte are kind of feuding now. I would have them feud now a little bit and then... Like, not have them feud between now and WrestleMania, but, like, go back to it in time for Mania. A lot like with Bianca and Becky a few years ago. They had a feud coming out of their first championship match at SummerSlam. They had a few ma matches after that on Raw and on Pay-Per-View and whatever in late 2021. They moved away from it and went back to it for Mania. I would do the same thing with Charlotte and Bianca. Maybe that's a non-title match. It doesn't need to be for a championship. I think that'd be a really cool non-title WrestleMania women's match. They're probably not going to do that. Ideally, though, EO, regardless of who she cashes in on, whether it be Bianca again, Charlotte to run it back from NXT, or even Asuka, those are like the top three main choices, I would think, from SmackDown. Um, I would love to see it. I think it's a lot more likely she cashes in before then, though. But ideally, uh, that would be a pretty cool idea. His second question, uh, would you want to see a feud between John Cena and L.A. Knight? Yeah, he said. Uh, the answer is yeah, I, of course I would. I know LA Knight's basically a babyface at this point, so it would have to be down the road. I mean, like, I know Cody and Cena is a feud that people want to see, and Cody's a babyface. It doesn't have to be a heel facing Cena. I just think it would make more sense. A heel LA Knight versus Cena, I've always said, would be a great feud. Um, it's a little trickier when he's a babyface. I know he's really over. People probably wouldn't turn on him. Maybe that could be where he turns heel. I don't know. But either way, on paper, regardless of the character dynamic, I feel like that would be a really good feud between the two. Um, it would be a great spot for... I, I would say it would be a great spot for LA Knight, but then again, Theory was in that spot at Mania, and he has not benefited at all. Just due to the booking of the match, the feud, the aftermath, I think LA Knight would be better off 
than Theory. I just feel like he's more... I, I love Theory. I think he's great. I just think LA Knight is a more complete package than Austin Theory and would fare well... would fare better in that spot than Theory did. Um, but yeah, I think a feud between the two would be great. That feels like it'd be, it would be WrestleMania worthy, in my opinion. His third question. Uh, WWE has some great themes for their wrestlers. Who in WWE has a slept-on theme song but is honestly a banger? But, it, like, it's honestly a banger, he's asking. A slept-on theme song. I've really grown to like Tyler Bates' new music. I know that's very random. Uh, he's in NXT. I liked his old song more. And I thought the rendition of, like, the new song was like, oh, this is shit. But I've actually listened to it more. I don't want to say it gives me, like, Monsters, Inc. themes. But, like, I don't know. His new theme, it's available now on Spotify and on YouTube and shit, is pretty good. I also really liked Alexa Bliss's theme uh, before she took time off. The new remixed version of her theme that they debuted right before she took time off around the Rumble six months ago was pretty fucking good, actually. Um, I don't know if that would count or not, but uh, that would be one of them. I'm trying to think of other themes like in WWE right now that are like, wow, this is like a slept on song. Probably for someone that's just not that good. I mean, I think Waller is a good theme song. Uh, Carmelo Hayes is a good song. They're not like bangers, but they're like pretty good songs. I'm trying to think. I'm looking at the roster now. Um, You know, like people that have slept on songs that you would be like, wow, this is like a, a great fucking song. Finn Balor's new heel song I really dig. I think he has a really good song. Gargano's new theme is inferior to the other one, but it's not bad. Um, hmm, Matt Riddle's song I really, really like. I don't know if that would count. Chompa got his old theme back, which is pretty sick. I'm very happy about that. Uh, for the women, I mean, EO's got a banger of a song. I don't know if it's underrated, but she's got a great song. Rhea's song is awesome. Again, not exactly slept on, but it's great. Bobby's song, People Know, is good. He, people Know His Song is good. Same thing with uh, Roman Reigns. LA Knight's got an amazing song. I think people know that as well. Um, those would be my top picks. I'm looking at the women as well. Those would probably be my top picks. I didn't go to NXT, but I already mentioned the ones from NXT I would probably put in that category. Uh, next question from, I think it was Joe M. from YouTube as well. He's got a couple questions here. First one being the damn thing would scroll up. Why the fuck is it not working? All right, there we go. Will Braun Breaker debut on the main roster as a henchman for someone similar to how Drew McIntyre was used as for Dolph Ziggler? Um, no, I don't think he will, and I don't think he should. In retrospect, like, I was there for the McIntyre return on the main roster five years ago. Him coming in with Dolph was so fucking random. Like, I guess it was one way of turning him heel, but it was so weird because he was gone for a few months due to injury and then came back as a heel with Ziggler. And, like, they had no history, really. Like, I know they came up at the same time period in the late 2000s. But, like, it was so odd. And Ziggler was a non-factor at that point. I know Ziggler was basically a vehicle to get McIntyre on the show. And they became tag team champions. Ziggler was intercontinental champion. Ziggler didn't have a bad 2018. But I was just thinking, you could have brought him up as a threat immediately. And it wouldn't have made a difference. It was just very odd how they did that. Like, I know McIntyre was already on the main roster, so it wasn't like he was a complete nobody. Some main roster fans probably already know who Braun Breaker is from some of the appearances he's made on Raw and just the time he spent on NXT. So he's not a complete nobody to some of the WWE audience, that WWE universe, whatever. Um, I would not do that. I think Braun Breaker can be a player on either Raw or SmackDown as soon as he gets called up. World title contender, maybe not right away, but, like, he can be someone that wins the United States Championship pretty much immediately. So him being heavy for someone else, I wouldn't do that. I feel like it'd be a waste. I mean, especially if it was for someone like fucking Dolph Ziggler, you know. Um, is it a good spot for him to be in? Maybe. But, like, especially now more than ever, they acknowledge stuff from NXT on the main roster. They're kind of like, it's a seamless transition now. Not that all main roster call-ups are great, but... You know, it seems like anything that happens on NXT, they acknowledge on the main roster for the most part at this point. Um, him going from, like, the top dog in NXT and then going to the main roster as, like, a henchman for someone else just doesn't fit his character, just wouldn't make sense. If he was still very green, he's not super seasoned, but if he was still super green, then maybe. But he's not. He's got experience. He was NXT champion for a fucking year. He's a two-time NXT champion. If he's Rollins for the World Heavyweight Championship recently, I, I wouldn't do that personally. I'm not even really sure who you would put him with. Uh, it's certainly not The Miz. Let's not get that idea in our heads. Um, I would probably just put him on Raw or SmackDown right away and make him a top player right off the bat. Probably sm maybe Raw. I'm not really sure. Either one would be fine. 
Uh, his second question, who has a higher ceiling in WWE, Bronson Reed or Grayson Waller? That's a really good question. He goes on to say, I know Bronson's been more dominant, obviously, but the fact that Waller was trusted to have his own segment with John Cena so soon in his main roster career makes me hopeful that there might be bigger plans for him than what I had anticipated. You know, that's a tough question because you could say either guy and you wouldn't be wrong. I think of the two, in my opinion, who has a higher ceiling as a world champion in this company? Bronson Reed. I think Grayson Waller's great. I'm a big fan of both guys. I think Waller's awesome. People could say he's a more athletic Miz. That doesn't really do him justice because I think he is better than the Miz in certain aspects. Maybe just because he feels fresher than the Miz. Miz is great. Um, Waller is just better in the ring. That's just a fact. I don't look at Waller as someone who could be a world champion. Maybe just not right now, probably. Um, I know Miz was a world champion and that worked for as long as it lasted. Not the second run. The first run, obviously, over 10 years ago. Waller, I just kind of feel like is a great mid-card, upper mid-card guy. Could be world champion, maybe. Just doesn't strike me as that type of persona. Maybe just down the road. Bronson's a guy with his current character, if pushed properly, can be a world champion, in my opinion. I mean, he's been protected. The guy can work. He just gives off a star aura with how he dresses. He can talk. I think Bronson Reed can be a better world champion. Who has a higher chance of being a world champion in this company? Grayson Waller if that makes sense. You said a higher ceiling in WWE. I'm going to say Waller. I feel like they just might give up on Bronson Reed. I hate to say it. Not because he's not talented, just because they have a tendency to do that. Waller kind of fits more of the WWE style, like a loud mouth. He can also work. He was in a spot with John Cena at the pay-per-view. I'm going to say Waller, because he's also younger too. But who would I rather see as world champion? Could be a better world champion? Could, who could I see more as a main event player in this company? Bronson Reed. Who's more likely to be pushed? Grayson Waller. So, kind of both. I guess to answer your question, Waller. But I think Bronson Reed, if he was pushed properly anyway, uh, could be a better world champion. At Reborn Again, John Ritland from the Twitter machine and on YouTube Real Honesty with John Ritland. Check out his channel. Does great work. His first question was, uh, he says, uh, first... Happy 4th of July, Graham. Happy 4th of July to you, John. Hope you had a great day. He said, uh, what are some wrestling events that have taken place on this day that stick out in your mind? I mean, his next question has to do with the Luger-Yokozuna thing. I mean, I wasn't even alive for that. Um, that would stand out from 30 years ago yesterday. Um, other events that have stood out on 4th of July? Not many. I think I've made a... I've either answered a question about this or I've done a video about like my favorite 4th of July matches. Uh, in the time that I've been watching wrestling, there have been a number of wrestling shows that have fallen on the 4th of July. NXT did last night, actually. Um, but, like, overall, Raw fell on on 4th of July last year. That does not stand out in my memory whatsoever. There was a 4th of July SmackDown 15 years ago, I think. And I think it was in OA. They did a 4th of July, like, fiddle four-way of July Independence Day United States Championship match. Like, the match was completely forgettable, but the idea of it, like a 4th of July Fatal 4-Way for the U.S. title, was, like, such a great idea, I thought, and I really thought they should have done that again. Um, but that one stands out just for the concept alone, not so much like the match itself. But I'm trying to think of other 4th of July matches they've done. 2011, they had a Raw on 4th of July. No matches, or, I mean... I remember watching Raw that year. Nothing really stands out. Same thing with 2016 when they had that food fight. Um, stupidly enough, I remember that food fight from Raw seven years ago on, on July 4th. That stands out in my mind. Um, I'm trying to think of other 4th of July shows. You know what? Probably Beast in the East from 2015. That might have been the best wrestling event to take place on 4th of July. And funnily enough, it wasn't even in America. It was that uh, Japan show. It was that show they did, henceforth Beast in the East, um, in Japan on 4th of July. It aired live in Japan. So they didn't even put it on delay on, on the WWE Network. They aired it live on the network at like fucking 3, 5 o'clock in the morning or something on 4th of July. I watched it when I woke up, and it was a really good show. That was the night that Balor beat Kevin Owens for the NXT Championship. And they did a bunch of other like forgettable house show matches in Japan that night. I just thought it was really cool they had a show on 4th of July, and I thought it was really cool they had a show live in Japan. And it was one of those first early network specials. They did that one. They did the MSG show. A couple of months later, and they also did the Canada Roadblock show in early 2016. They didn't do many more beyond that, but those stand out, and those were all really good shows. 
uh, specifically that first one, Beast in the East. So that would probably be my answer. I know that's not exactly old school, but I wasn't watching wrestling on, on you know Fourth of July before I started watching wrestling. I think there was a Raw on Fourth of July in two thousand and five. Um, I think that was when Shawn Michaels turned on Hogan. The only reason I remember that is because I've seen archive footage, not because I was watching back then. I would probably go with Beast in the East though from twenty fifteen. A lot of people might forget about that, but that stands out in my mind from that day. Um, let's see, next question, also from John. Looking back on when Luger slammed Yokozuna on the USS Intrepid, should Vince McMahon have gone ahead with Luger winning at SummerSlam 93? Do you think it would have worked out or flamed out? I know this was well before your time as a fan, but just curious. Honestly, in retrospect, I mean, Luger was never going to be, like, the guy long-term, but he was just so hot at that point. I honestly would have had Luger win at that pay-per-view. That is a prime example of not striking when the iron was hot. They thought he would still be as over six months down the road, and he wasn't. I mean, he was still popular, but not as popular as Bret Hart, who was the hot hand, and just a better fit as world champion. And if you're thinking, well, I mean, surely if Luger wins at SummerSlam 93, then the Bret Hart thing would have never happened. I mean, not necessarily. Uh, Listen, I know, so Hart became champion. He was champion at Mania 9. And if the idea was, well, he lost to Yokozuna that night and he might get the belt back down the road, I don't think that was ever the long-term plan for two reasons. Hogan took the belt off of Yokozuna immediately. So it wasn't even like Yokozuna was champion from Mania to Mania. He lost it right away. He lost it right away to Hogan, who then dropped it a couple months later when Hogan left the company. So the Hogan thing interrupted that. And then Luger came about and... They were planning on putting the belt on Luger at some point. Maybe not necessarily at SummerSlam, but they weren't planning on putting the belt on Bret Hart. They were planning on putting the belt on Luger. So it's not like, oh, the long-term story with Bret Hart's got to work out. No, it it did work out in the end, but it wasn't intentional. So I don't really think it was more a matter of, like, Hart avenging his loss to Yokozuna because it wasn't even that great of a match anyway. It was just more about it was more about Brett getting the belt back at some point, even if it wasn't intentional. You could have done that with Luger. I would have given the belt to Luger at that point because he was the hot hand. Again, would he have been a main eventer long term? Probably not, but he would have gotten his moment. It would have made sense. People would have been happy to see it. Like they were when he won via count out, which was so dumb because he didn't win the championship, but you would think he did based on how he was celebrating. You could have given him the championship, and then if Brett started to get more over than Luger, which I think would have been inevitable you could have turned Luger heel. And Luger facing Brett at Mania could have been the match. Luger could have been champion for like a good six, eight months. And he could have dropped the belt to Hart at WrestleMania as a heel. And if he was still over at that point, you could have done babyface. I mean, I guess they did that with Hogan and Warrior a couple years earlier and they didn't want to repeat it, I guess. But, you know, it was an option. They could have done that as well. So yeah, I would have, long story short, I probably would have given the championship to Luger. And Luger, again, was not the greatest in-ring worker ever, but he was so over, he was a good enough worker where I think it would have worked out as a short-term experiment. Yokozuna was great, but it's not like he was in there having bangers. And it wasn't like he was this unstoppable force forever. He was another guy who was only champion for that short period. After it was over, he was never a main eventer again. So it really didn't matter who Hart beat at Mania at 10. Because, again, the story of WrestleMania 10 wasn't even about Hart beating Yokozuna. It was about him winning the championship... Well, after already losing to Owen. And that was the real story. Owen beat Brett, but oh, uh, Brett wins the championship. It wasn't that Brett beat Yokozuna. Yokozuna already lost via count out at SummerSlam. He lost to Hogan. You know, he wasn't like the best book superstar ever. It was more about Brett winning the title. Brett could have very just as easily won it from Luger. And then you could have continued on just the same with Brett and Owen feuding over the belt in the months that followed. So... Yes, I would have given Luger the championship in 93, 30 years ago. Not yesterday. I was going to say 30 years ago yesterday. The intrepid thing was 30 years ago yesterday. Uh, His third question, as of now, AEW has sold 75,000 tickets for Wembley. Do you think they can actually sell it out? Um, Can they? Yes. Do I think they will? No. I've said that. I mean, 75 is a lot. It's close to 75, whatever. I mean, they would have to sell, what, another... 15,000? I mean, that's a lot. Will match announcements cause 15,000 tickets being moved? No, I don't think so. I think they could come close. Could they reach 80? Yeah, I think it's possible they reach 80. The fact that the fact they've hit 75 without announcing a single match is awesome. I think they can move a couple thousand more with more match announcements and who's going to be on the show and stuff like that. 
uh, pushing 90, what is it, 95, whatever the capacity is. I think it's 90. Um, again, is it impossible? No. Can they do it? Yeah. Will they do it? Probably not. I don't think they will. I think they'll get close. I don't think them announcing Punk and Jay White, for example, or whatever match they're going to do. Unless it's Punk and the Elite, then maybe, which they're not going to do. I don't think any match is big enough for them to move 15,000 tickets. I'd love to be wrong. I don't think I am. Not because I like to be right, but just because I think uh, that that's a lot of tickets to move in the matter of like a month and a half. Match or no match. It doesn't really matter what they announce. But we'll see. At noob underscore n underscore, underscore co, uh, their first question was, what are your thoughts on Damian Priest and EO Sky winning their respective Money in the Bank ladder matches? And who do you think they should cash in on for Damian Priest, the world title, to further the breakup for Judgment Day? And EO having a failed cash in on Asuka just to start their feud. <laughs> No, noob. I know you're an Asuka fan. Asuka, or EO rather, should not cash in unsuccessfully. Listen, that's not a terrible idea. EO would become the first woman to cash in unsuccessfully, so it's not like they have a bad track record with the women. I would not have her cash in soon. I don't think there's a rush. Have her cash in on Bailey. Could she cash in on Asuka and then Bailey cost her the title? Yes. That is possible. That would put EO in shape. Listen. Saying that right away, I didn't like the idea. I like it a little more when you map it out this way. Maybe Bailey cost her... Uh, I mean, she shouldn't lose clean. That'd be fucking dumb. I think th- there's two ways you can go about this. Whatever was said earlier, one of the questions was, could she... I think it was Micah. Could she announce her cash in that way and win that way? Or, like, he didn't actually... He didn't ask that. He asked, could she cash in a mania? Yeah, I would have her announce it and then do it that way. I would prefer that. Your direction would be... Her cashing in and losing. To make that work, what I would do is this. She attempts to cash in, maybe not next week, but like maybe I, I would just have Bailey split away from her and she's jealous of the briefcase and that's what causes the split. Not her costing EO the championship. That's like using it, that's like using the fucking briefcase as a device to further a feud, like with Corbin and Cena back in 2017, as opposed to actually using the briefcase to get someone over. I don't like that, but this is the only exception I would make. Bailey cost EO the match, and then EO has to work through Bailey, and then she then faces Asuka in a rematch at Mania for the title. I don't know if that's what you implied. I mean, you said failed cashing. I'm trying to flush it out here to make it make sense. That's what I would do. If if you were to have a failed cashing, I wouldn't do a failed cashing, but if we're gonna do it your way, that's what I would do. I would have her fail the cash in by doing it that way. Uh, Bailey cost her, so she has an out for losing. She feuds with Bailey. She has to work her way back up through the ranks, and she goes back after the championship of Mania against Asuka. But it goes back to what I said earlier, though. I don't think Asuka will still be champion by Mania. I think she is just a transitional champion. The focus is on Bianca and Charlotte. One of them is bound to win the belt, and they are bound to feud over that fucking title. They don't need the title, but I'm, I'm sure that's going to happen. I wouldn't wait until Mania because then they might change their mind and put the belt on someone else. And then we don't get Asuka and EO at WrestleMania for the championship. Does that need a title? No, but like the whole point of EO being in chase mode is for her to win the title and not have a nine title feud. So I would just prefer her, her to cash in successfully, maybe announce in advance if she's supposed to be a babyface. Um, I would not have her, have her do a failed cash in unless it works out the way that I planned it out, which I don't think is all that likely. Their next question, what are your thoughts on Shayna Baszler turning on Ronda Rousey mid-match at Money in the Bank, then having her promo uh, on the next night's Raw, or Monday's Raw? You said last night, but we mean we mean Monday. Um, they say, I get the feeling that this is a first time where they're going, or we're going to get a work-shoot feud between them. I mean, it's obviously all, you know, scripted and whatnot. So, listen, I'm going to go into more detail about this on WrestleRant Radio tomorrow, Um I talked about it with RJ, and we just kind of talked about it in great detail. So I don't want to repeat myself. We already recorded it earlier because we can't record tomorrow. So I didn't like that it came mid-match. People are willing to excuse it because they just fucking hate Ronda, but we got to call a spade a spade here. It didn't make any sense. Shayna turning on Ronda isn't my problem. It's how they did it was the issue. It was mid-match. Why would she even bother winning the titles with this woman if she hates her so much? Why would she even do it mid-match? Why not do it before or after? Her losing the belts with Ronda, regardless of who gets pinned, and then Shayna turning on her makes a lot more sense. The way that she did it, explanation or not, on Monday's Raw, which, again, I get why she wanted to turn her, why she wanted to turn on her, but why did she want to turn on her then, right then and there? That is the part that doesn't make sense. 
that didn't make any sense to me at all. So they really needed to make that make sense. They didn't. Um, but I like the fact that Sheena has broken away from her. I mean, listen, I wanted them to elevate the tag team division. That's clearly not going to happen. That was never going to happen, I guess. Uh, they cut that short pretty fucking quickly. Whatever. I guess I was wrong on that one. (laughs) But, uh, if Ronda's last act is putting over Sheena on the way out, then more power to her. That's great. I'm not convinced that Sheena's push will, you know, remain consistent beyond SummerSlam. I am very skeptical about that, regardless of whether Sheena wins or not. And she will likely win if Ronda's on her way out. Um, that's great and all. I really appreciate that she wants to put Sheena over. I don't think they're going to keep Sheena strong coming out of SummerSlam. They'll probably have her beat Ronda and then have that be it. Like when Mandy and, and so it reminds me of that feud. You know, they didn't leave the company or anything, but Mandy beat Sony at SummerSlam. Big momentum win. WWE did fucking nothing with it. I don't even think Mandy was on the show after that for like a couple of weeks. Like her big momentum win at SummerSlam that year in 2020. They did nothing to follow that up. And that was annoying. So I think Shayna might end up in the same boat. That being said, I am looking forward to the match and I'm looking forward to the feud. If, if Shayna's promo on Monday was any, any indication... I'm looking forward to the feud. I might end up regretting that because Ronda's promos are awful most of the time at this point. Um, but what I got, what we got on Monday was good. So I am curious how the rest of the feud will shake out and how the match is going to go likely at SummerSlam. Um, at Iwagu91, their first question was, do you think that Xavier Woods will become world champion in the WWE like his New Day brethren have? Uh, no, not a chance. I think, could Woods be a world champion? I mean, anyone could be a world champion. I think Woods is awesome. One, he doesn't strike me as like a world champion type uh, competitor consistently. Honestly, Kofi, even though Woods is better in the ring, I I could see Kofi being more of a perennial main event player than Xavier Woods. Woods strikes me more as an upper mid-card guy, mid-card champion. I think he should be a mid-card champion and get his moment that way. I don't think he'll ever be world champion. The guy's been in the company for a decade, and I know Kofi was too when he won the WWE title, but... Woods isn't Kofi. Kofi had a, just a different fan support with the audience. Uh, Woods has been around forever, but people have never really... I mean, Kofi was also a multi-time IC and U.S. champion. Woods doesn't even have that. He should be, but he's not. He won King of the Ring. Great. But I just don't see him ever being a world champion. Would it be a cool moment if he did? I mean, yeah, absolutely. I just don't ever see that happening. Um, his next question, do you, think, do you think that Wesley is the best NXT North American champion? I do. Um, I mean, he's the longest reigning at this point. He's had a lot of great matches. He's been a fighting champion. He's on the show consistently. He's over. There's been a lot of good North American champions, but I would say he is the best. Carmelo Hayes was up there, too. Hayes had a great run as North American champion, both times, the first run and the second run. Uh, If it was an uninterrupted reign, then I might say Carmelo, but it was broken in two. It was two different runs. Carmelo, I would put on that Mount Rushmore as well. Uh, Johnny was champion three times, but never really had a memorable run as champion. Uh, Adam Cole had a really good run. It didn't last all that long, but he was a nice fit for that title. Ricochet had a good run. Velveteen Dream, I mean, the guy was obviously ended up being problematic. He had a good run for as long as he was champion. Roddy did too. Um, Keith Lee also had a really good run as North American champion for as long as he was champion. Which was a while, I think. I think he was champion from, like, what, January to July? He was also a really good champion. I I mean, I know this isn't your question. I would probably put Wesley, Carmelo, Keith Lee, and likely Ricochet, if not Velveteen Dream on that list. Um, But of the bunch, Wesley is the best, for sure. He's the best North American champion, I think, we've had so far. His third question. If Drew McIntyre becomes world champion in the WWE again... Do you suppose it'll be the World Heavyweight title? I do. I mean, he's on Raw. He could always be drafted back to where the WWE title is, but uh, I I think there's a better chance he wins the World Championship in the next year on Raw than the WWE title. It would also be a different championship he hasn't held before, too, so I think that'd also be cool. Um, If he does become World Champion again and he sticks around, which I think he will, and I think if he sticks around, then he will be World Champion again. I think the only reason why he wasn't World Champion again after 2020 or 2021 or whatever, was because we had one belt. And he did chase the other title. Like, he didn't chase the... I mean, he held the non-Roman title. And then they merged the two championships, and he almost beat Roman last year, but then he didn't. So, um, yeah. No, I think he he will be World Heavyweight Champion at some point. I, I think it's more a matter of when than if. Unless he leaves, which 
is possible. I just don't think he will. Um, at Bill Meister 88, their question was, he said, Graham, I saw in Bleach Report you predicted uh, Damian Priest would win men's money in the bank. My prediction too. But we both wanted LA Knight to win it. Where does LA Knight go from here? At this rate, I think him winning a world title would be a bigger story when Roman loses the championship. All right. So he's asking what's next for LA Knight. I don't think I actually predicted Damian Priest to win. I think I predicted Logan Paul. Um, unless I did write down Priest by accident. But I, I, I did predict Logan Paul, to be honest. I appreciate the credit, but I, I did want LA Knight to win. I thought there was a chance Damian could win. I thought my prediction was that Logan Paul would win. I'm glad Damian did, though. Where does LA Knight go from here? Well, listen, I've said I, I thought a Logan Paul feud would make sense. And because Logan Paul is so hated... LA Knight is so beloved. And Logan Paul, whether you like him or not, is a big star. He's a, you know, social media sensation. And listen, he's good in the ring. He can have good promos. I think they could have a really good back and forth in the mic. We've seen little it's and bits and pieces of that so far, but not a full-fledged exchange. I would like to see them feud. However, we're already getting Logan Paul and Ricochet. We found that out on Raw. Ricochet called out Logan. They're not having a match on Raw. They're having a face-off next week on Raw. They're going to have a match at SummerSlam. Why else would they fucking be doing that? Logan Paul does not wrestle on TV. So, that's not happening. The next best choice is him chasing the United States Championship. I mean, I don't really know what else you do. And him feuding with Edge would be nice, and I think that was another question that I'll get to. But the problem with that, though, is that LA Knight is so over, it just doesn't make sense. To force him as a heel, as great of a heel as he is, I just don't think it makes sense. Run with the fact he's a babyface. Run with the fact that people like him. Why would you just go against that? That just seems counterproductive to me. Um, LA Knight and Edge would have been a nice feud if LA Knight wasn't so over as it is. But he is a babyface. I just wouldn't turn him heel again or keep him as a heel or whatever. So with that being said, just give him the U.S. title. That belt means nothing right now around the waist of Austin Theory, who's had a very forgettable run in recent months. Take that belt off of Theory. Give him the U.S. championship and hey, when the Roman run is over next year, maybe he can go after that championship. Maybe he can beat Cody for that belt in the summer of next year. He's not winning a world championship anytime soon. Could he eventually? Yes. Do I think he will? I'm not sure. Do I think he should? 1,000% he should, absolutely. Kyle Rochelle, 19, their question was, I know Raw and SmackDown can be hit or miss, but what do you think about WWE's pay-per-views this year? Is Why is the WWE pay-per-view so much better than the TV shows? That's a great question. I don't know. Uh, whenever it matters most, WWE knocks it out of the park this year. They really have. I mean, I said this in a tweet the next day after Money in the Bank. But I don't think, and correct me if I'm wrong, this company has had such a stellar stretch of pay-per-views in at least 15 years or more. I said 15 years in the tweet because I've been watching for 15 years. I've seen every WWE pay-per-view. I just can't think off the top of my head, like, what year at a great string of shows. I'm compelled to say 2000. 2000 had a stellar stretch of shows. Like, Mania 2000 sucked. But, like, a lot of those shows that year were really, really good, specifically that summer. So, probably 2000. That was 23 years ago. I'm not even saying these shows are as good as those. But, like, WWE hasn't produced a bad pay-per-view in a very long time. Like, every pay-per-view this year has been good to great to excellent. Night 2 of Mania was kind of, like, shaky, but... Mania 39 overall was a success. It was a great show. Elimination Chamber was a fantastic show. Rumble was a very good show. Net of Champions was a very good show. Backlash was an excellent show. And Money in the Bank was an excellent show as well. You go back to 2020. Crown Jewel was a good show. Survivor Series was a very good show. Um, Extreme Rules, a very good show. Clash of the Castle, great show. SummerSlam, pretty good show. They haven't had a bad pay-per-view in a while. And even AEW's had a couple misses here and there. WWE is not. And I, I don't get it either. I don't understand. Raw and SmackDown, like you said, you nailed it, are hit or miss. Raw specifically, I, I, I'm kinder to the shows than some people. It's not because I am a mark, but I just, I don't know, I enjoy the shows more than some people. But some of the shows are very fucking boring. And I'll say if they are, if they're boring, I'll, I'll tell you it's boring. SmackDown has been very hit or miss as well. The Bloodline stuff carries that show. They've had some great segments in some of these shows, but the overall shows, Raw specifically, just being three hours is a fucking death sentence. SmackDown being two hours also just isn't always great. They don't have a lot of great, consistent storylines. But when it matters most on pay-per-view, they've knocked it out of the park. I guess it's better than the other way around as far as, like, oh, Raw and SmackDown are great, but, like, the show, the pay-per-views that you actually pay money for are terrible. 
Like, if it was the other way around, that might be more of a problem. I just wish it was all consistently good. Like, Raw and SmackDown are just so hit or miss. If it was solid is one thing. Raw just usually just sucks. Or it's just boring. The, the shows aren't terrible, but, like, they're typically so inconsequential that there's no reason to tune in. SmackDown can be like that most weeks as well. I just don't get it. They need more consistency. And I say that with Dynamite, too. AEW is the same way. Just why can't we get more consistency? Um, last couple of questions here from Matt. The Average Grunt. First question. Hot or cold? They're all hot or cold questions. WWE could have made the invasion angle work with the talent they had on hand had they just treated the guys like DDP, Rhino, and Booker T with more respect and booked them as proper threats. Having Big Show, Tajiri, and X-Pac join them would have also helped. So you're saying that they could have made the invasion invasion work uh, with the talent that they had. No, I, I don't think so. They're not threats. I mean, DDP, Rhino, and Booker T are not fucking NWO or Goldberg or Ric Flair or whatever. I mean, the invasion was botched anyway. The invasion could have been better with the talent that they brought in, but Rhino just is not the NWO. He was not the fucking Rock, dude. He just, he wasn't. They had Stone Cold Rock and all these other top talents on the WWE side. The WCW people they brought in, I mean, Tajiri and Xbox, what are we, what are we doing here? Um, no. So I, I don't think that would have made that much of a difference. It would have made it better, but it wouldn't have made it work. Your next question. Um, so I, I guess cold or a hot take, I guess, I guess that's how this works. I guess that's a, uh, a hot take is I don't agree with that. Hot or cold stone cold joining the Alliance makes more sense than people say his real life issues were never with WCW as a whole. It was with Eric Bischoff, who wasn't even a part of the angle. So I can totally buy that he would join the WCW ECW side to fuck over Vince. Yeah, no, that, I mean, yeah, I mean, I wasn't watching back then. I mean, yeah, it was just, I think what people, what bothered people was that heel Stone Cold, as entertaining as it was, people didn't want to boo him. So when he came out on Raw as a babyface that one week before he went back to being a heel with like that tease, people were ready for that. And then they were disappointed, like, oh, fuck, he, he's back to being a heel. Again, I wasn't watching back then, so I can't tell you by experience, from experience, but that's just the vibe that I got. Um, yeah, I mean, him joining the Alliance, they needed star power, and it did make sense. I mean, he was a WWE guy through and through, but he hated Vince, and he hated Eric Bischoff, and Bischoff wasn't there. So, yeah, that that's a, uh, it's, it's, I don't know if it's a hot take, but it's, it's, a, it's a take that I agree with. And his last question also about the invasion. Hot or cold? I don't know ECW being included in the invasion was a bad move. I know the Monday Night Wars were between WWF and WCW specifically, but all three major companies at the time fighting it out in a huge angle was still cool to see. A uh, cold take in the sense that, yeah, ECW being involved wasn't an issue. It was the execution of ECW being involved. If it was a three-way invasion, again, the stars of ECW were not bigger than the stars of WWE, obviously. But had they done it properly with a three-way feud, as opposed to Stephanie fucking McMahon being the owner of ECW and joining WCW later that night, then yeah, it could have worked, but it didn't. They were just like the henchmen of EC, uh, of WCW. That was very dumb. So again, I wasn't watching back then, so it's hard for me to say, but just looking back on it, ECW being involved was awesome. And that's like having, it's like, I mean, they weren't as popular as WWE, but that's like 15 years ago, bringing in TNA and Ring of Honor. And a Ring of Honor just joins TNA. I mean, I guess they're stronger together than they are apart, but it would have been cooler with Ring of Honor's talent on their own trying to get... I mean, it's not even the same thing as Ring of Honor wasn't ECW and TNA sure as fuck was not WCW. But I just think keeping them separate would have been the way to go. WWE did not see it that way. WWE's narrative is always, it's everyone else, it's the world versus us. And so ECW is lumped in with WCW and they beat them all anyway. <laughs> they were all made to look inferior. And that's going to do it guys for episode 501 of Hashtag here today. Thank you so much for checking out the show per usual. Um, episode 501 is even weird to say but 500 episodes plus is great. Thank you so much guys for the support. I appreciate it. We'll be back next week with another episode so be sure to send in those questions via Twitter at WrestleRant with the hashtag AskGSM Find me on Facebook as well, facebook.com backslash graham.jason.matthews. Drop a comment on the post I usually put up on Tuesday nights, if not on the wall itself. And drop a question down below in the comment section on this very video and include your question in next week's edition. Have an awesome one, guys. I'm Graham GSM Matthews. Have a great week, and I'll catch your ass down the road.